はい。日本のオリンピックを通して日本の文化、日本人っていうのをあの発信するチャンスだと思います。And I believe the people of UK started to understand um, how the world see, saw them. I believe Japan will also have to change toward 2020. So what stance should we take in understanding ourselves if you have any um, advice for us? That's my first question. And my second question may sound a bit strange. Uh, the logo marks, the Olympic logo marks, and the ca characters, the Wenlock, uh, how were those created? I thought something strange suddenly came out when I first saw the characters. Uh, I believe there were many opinions for and against uh, the characters. But in the end, I think people f felt dearly, dearly about uh, the characters. I actually have a key holder of the logo. <laughs> Were you aiming to have that kind of effect, or how did that come about? Well, thank you very much for a very good question, I believe, or two good questions. Um, so for the first question, w Ruth, would you like to answer how can we communicate about Japan toward the world? Um, Actually, I will answer both the questions, if I may, uh, because um, one, I think, is the mirror reflection of the other. Um, so for me, the answer of your first very important question uh, is you must trust the artists. Um, the reason that we have artists is because they conceive things that we cannot and they give us insights to ourselves and sometimes to issues or problems. Uh, that is why we love artists. So for me, the answer is you must trust your artists, commission them, protect them so they can truly express themselves. Do not censor them, allow them to criticize, allow them to have new ideas and new insights. Uh, and this has been a truth, of course, since ancient Greece. Again, it always goes back to ancient Greece. Um, think of Greek plays and how they gave truths to the democracies that politicians and ordinary people could not perceive or understand. And my answer to the second question is, first of all, it was the marketing department of the London Olympics that designed, that commissioned the logo and commissioned the mascots. It was not part of 
the artistic program. And that means that artists were not invited to make the logo or to make the mascots. We did invite artists to make the posters, and I'm proud of the results of our great artists and the beautiful posters to sell the Olympics and Paralympic Games. But I cannot defend the logo or the mascots. And for me, it's a good example of why it would be better to trust the artists rather than trust the brand and communication companies. Thank you very much. Um, Justin, Moira, you have anything to add? The one thing I would add to the first part of your question is that in my experience, young people in particular were able to look at us and our society with fresh eyes. And the more you can engage and involve them in the program, the better. A really good example of that would be uh, a national poetry slam. I don't know if you have that in Japan, but spoken word poetry, um, which ran all across the country. And the young people came into London to perform their pieces. And many of them talked about what it was like to be a young person, back to, ad back to adults. And, and I think they, they were part of the reimagining of ourselves and understanding who we were in a very powerful way. Um, I think it's interesting also to look at our opening ceremony. We weren't involved in the opening ceremony, but there was something very powerful about that and uh, a British identity. I think it's fair to say that government had tried for a long time to capture what is British identity for many, many years. Um, and it's been a very difficult thing to build a consensus around. Um, and when everyone watched the opening ceremony, it was led by an artist, it was led by a film director, Danny Boyle. And uh, he had a free reign and he did put some things in there that people felt were controversial. but. There was a collective moment, I think, across the nation where everyone looked at it and said, ah, that's who we are, um, which is very interesting. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, Mr. Kondo, please, and please use the microphone. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Kondo. And I also have two questions. Number one, toward the London Olympics, I believe you have invested a lot of time and money into culture, and uh, you have attracted a lot of attention. Uh, were there any resistance against that? Especially when we say culture, we have contemporary art, which is probably the major focus. Were there any traditional um, people who wanted to focus more on um, older um, arts. Were there any politicians who were also resistant against that? How did you overcome that if there were any resistances? And second is, for the next six years, we will have to t um, input a lot of time and money into culture. Is it really going to continue? Uh, can we continue over the six years? Um, uh, that may be very um, difficult. That's why I was asking the first question. And my second question is toward 2020. The image of Japan, what should we focus as the image of Japan? For example, or for example, from Europe, um, what is the positive image that you have about Japan, and what is the negative image that you have of Japan? I believe we should emphasize uh, the positive while we try to downplay the negative. And in that sense, in London, uh, like the air pollution or the London Tower tragedies, those negative images that people have, I believe you had that in mind when you came up with your vision. So. Concerning Japan, what do you see as a negative image of Japan so that we can um, eliminate those? I believe earthquakes or the nuclear power plant accident. How 
big a negative image is that and how much should that we consider that and also what do you see as positive i think um animation um is a very big thing now and food also but some conservative people will say that well animation may not be a representative culture of japan so how much should we emphasize that and strengthen that as part of our um, strength? Thank you very much. It was a very valuable uh, question. So first was about uh, as making the cultural an important program, and uh, we did receive comments uh, from Justine about the various uh, obstacles. Uh, what how what kind of uh, obstacles were there, and how you overcome? I think that was mainly about the first question. So can I ask Moira to answer first? I'm looking at my colleagues, but I think there was undoubtedly resistance, um, not only to culture but actually to to the Olympics. And I think you should be prepared for um, the enthusiasm of the public and of politicians to go up and down through the next six years. And if you're ready for that, it's less disheartening when it's right at the bottom. I can certainly remember having conversations um, where we had to work very hard to remind people that culture could bring huge benefits to the country after the games as well as in the lead up to the games. There were also various moments, I think, when politicians were concerned about the content that was going to be put into the program or into the opening ceremony. One of the experiences that had been less successful in the UK had been the Millennium Dome, a program to celebrate the turn of the millennium. And in a way that was quite useful for us because we could point at a project which had not had a clear artistic and cultural vision and had been very expensive and had not achieved what it set out to achieve and keep stating that we needed clear artistic vision, we needed independence. Uh, actually, the establishment of an arts council which is at arm's length from government helped a lot at various moments in time in that conversation as well. Would you like to more about resistance. I, I, the arm's length principle is a very useful principle which I commend to you. So the idea is uh, that uh, arts and artists should not be dealt with directly by government. There should be an independent organisation that looks after the artists and that is our Arts Council. So government gives money to the Arts Council but it's the Arts Council that gives money to the artists. Um, and the other principle which I think is vital is to give the trust to a cultural person to be artistic director and make the decisions about the artists. So give the power to me and my board, the Cultural Olympiad board, who as you heard were also cultural people. Because we had to protect the artists and sometimes we had to protect the freedom of the artists. Uh, so I will not pretend that there were not moments, sometimes weekly moments in my meetings with politicians where they tried to influence our decisions. But at least they were not talking directly to artists. They were talking to me and my job was to be the person who protected the artist. It's not always an easy job, but it is a very important job um, because the principle of freedom for your artists is a vital principle. Um, and you will never get great art if you allow your artists to be influenced by people. The artist must be free to express, even if that freedom takes them and you to places that may be uncomfortable. But I would say that the politicians were fantastically enthusiastic and supportive also when the final festival happened, so that they joined in congratulating us on our successes with great good heart and great generosity. And, you know, I could not do their job, and it is unreasonable to attack them for not necessarily being as good at my job as me. 
Um, and at least what they did was appoint us to do our jobs, us, the cultural professionals, and to take those difficult decisions to commission artists to say no to some projects, to say yes to other projects. These are not easy things to do, but somebody has to do them, and it's good that it was a cultural team that did them, not a political team. Um, you mentioned the Great Earthquake, and um, I know we were learning yesterday that already cultural projects are in train um, to look at you know, what this meant and what it could mean culturally and how that could be reflected and understood in the context of the festival. Um, and the thing that I would say about when we hosted the Games is that, as Moira said, you go on a journey, I think, as a nation. So you win it and you're excited, and then you realise how much it's going to cost, um, and there's a kind of bit of depression um, and upset. And I think that it took us all completely by surprise the extent to which this moment drew us together as a country. There was a collective euphoria um, and joining together, um, which took us all by surprise. I mean, quite a lot of people were negative about it in across the UK and in London, and it was unstoppable. You know, no one could kind of resist the kind of collective moment, I think, by the end, and all of those naysayers kind of had to roll over and accept that it was a great thing for the nation, for the city. Um, and so I think it's, it's going to be an extraordinarily powerful time. And culturally, that's a very interesting territory to explore and to express. Can I say one more thing? Because we did not answer your question about the image of Japan. And that is because it is not our job, I think, to do that. Um, but I think that uh, you, you should um, celebrate the diversity of cultures that you have uh, and, and think about the, w what you wish to say to the world because it is such a great chance to say things to the world, as you've heard, um, at a time when the world is listening, uh, when you will have everybody um, following you uh, we, we experimented a lot with digital art. We haven't told you much about it, but by 2020, your ways of communicating with the world through your art will be so rich and so diverse. You have such a great chance. And I, I would say that we did include every art form, but we have not shown you as many photographs of more traditional art forms, um, just because... Uh, uh, we wanted to share some of the more unusual ideas. Thank you very much. Maybe we can take uh, one more question. Hello, uh, my name is Kano. I'm an art history graduate from University College London. Uh, thank you very much for coming today and congratulations for such an extraordinary uh, event in London. Um, I've got two questions. Um, one is related to uh, a couple of reports I've been um, downloading and reading from the um, Arts Council England uh, website um, relating to the sustainability of uh, the um, uh, cultural industry, cultural economy. Um, and um, uh, it was mentioned somewhere, I remember, that it is good in an arts organisation to invite, to em employ uh, people who are not related to the arts, people with a business background, people with a vision um, that uh, is basically making creative ideas turn into um, uh, beautiful realities in terms of you know finances as well. Uh, I, and I wanted to ask if uh, you have uh, invited uh, people non-related to the arts um, on your board. This is the first question. And the second question is related to the communication between the public and the private sector. I was wondering if you find this important. I don't know if you know that um, um, recently um, Ex Expo to Japan, a new initiative has been launched by the British Embassy and the B BCJ and the UKTI and um, uh, British companies are uh, trying to come to enter the Japanese market and obviously they've got their own reasons to expand in Japan till 2020. And um, I was um, reading a report published by Nesta uh, last year which is... Um, 
entitled a call for action 10 lessons for local authority innovators and they were saying there the difference with the private sector is that innovative firms are far more effective at turning ideas into action through franchise ex expansion new business development and acquisition do you think it would be important to um, for, for, for the arts council to find an opportunity in the business development with the UK and with with other countries thank you very much So I'll talk about general policy issues and then maybe Ruth and Justine can talk a bit about the relationship with the sponsors for the Olympic Games. Um, so Arts Council, you're right, Arts Council England has been stressing um, the importance of uh, business and business skills to the arts and cultural sector. That's because we're going through um, an economically challenging time and public funding for the arts has declined over the last um, four or five years. And so uh, I would not want to emphasize the employment of business expertise um, at the risk of damaging artistic expertise. But I think we recognize that there is business strength that can be brought to our cultural sector, particularly around issues like marketing, um, uh, commercializing some of the content and activity of the arts and cultural sector. Uh, there is lots of information, as you say, online, and we could have a very long discussion about the balance between public investment and private investment in the arts. I think for us, we continue to maintain that public investment is a critical factor, particularly in allowing for the element of risk and innovation that Ruth categorizes as being so important in terms of the artistic quality that we saw during the Olympic Games. Um, and in terms of sponsorship, um, that's another area that the UK has developed over a long period of time. I think our experience to date is that it's much easier to attract sponsorship in major urban conurbations than it is in rural areas, for obvious reasons. That's where major corporate sponsors tend to be based and where they want to see their brands exp exploited. But there is potential to grow that sponsorship and there is certainly potential for, um, for Japanese arts organizations looking at English companies trying to make a market here to think about how they might build those private and public partnerships. Ruth, do you want to say something about sponsorship in the Olympics? Yes. Um, uh, sponsors, there's a great opportunity, of course, for cultural organizations um, with sponsors in the Olympics because the Olympics brings uh, a, a whole new market of international sponsors who arrive for the Olympics and are sponsoring the Olympics, but they activate their sponsorship. They bring an additional budget to make their sponsorship fly. And that um, is available if you develop your cultural vision and plan now, then you can engage with those Olympic sponsors to activate their sponsorship through your cultural program. But also, of course, more generally, the Olympics is a great opportunity for uh, rich and diverse partnerships. We were able through the London 2012 Festival to involve many, many partners, both public and private, even non-Olympic sponsors, which everyone said would not be possible. It is possible. Uh, you have to be very careful and precise about your brand rules. And this is not an interesting subject for a large forum like this but maybe later on in smaller groups we can talk in more detail about the, how you make those partnerships work. But the main principle is that with planning and negotiation you can make partnerships across all of those sectors and of course with UK artists and partners as well as with Japanese and people from other countries in the world. That's a policy choice for you, not for us. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We have about 20 minutes left, I believe. There may be some more questions, but I'd like to now move on to the discussion part. Um, with the last question, uh, I think uh, the question was with whether there was a business person in the board. The Cultural Olympiad board, um, I don't think there was a business person. Um, Tony, Tony Hall was the chairman, and uh, many were involved or in the cultural sector. And They protected the artists and they prote protected your direction. Um, uh, those were the people led by Tony Hall. And S Tony Hall also was involved in LOCOG. Um, in LOCOG, of course, you had a business person involved. I think that's the overall structure for the London Olympic uh, Games and um, the art projects. Now, um, all three of you came here on Wednesday, and since then you have been working really hard. And there's m a lot of things that we want to ask. There are many people um, in the audience um, with all kinds of different visions, but um, the artists and all the people in the cultural area, how do you get them involved, uh, give them um, vision, dreams, and encourage them that this is a once-in-a-lifetime kind of experience in making their um, masterpieces. We have heard about that. And many of the cultural people here uh, think that the Olympic is not their business. How can we get them involved? Um, yesterday at the British Council, we have heard uh, from people um, in the artistic world um, and in the producing world, um, Moira, and I believe you also were um, taking part in that. So if you can uh, talk based on your experience and also what you've heard over the two or three days, so starting with you, Moira, please. I think, um, I, I hope that our visit here has been partly about it, um, describing what the opportunity might be. And if we don't, we should leave you with the sense, if you're artists and cultural organisations in the room, that you, you should get engaged with the Olympic Games. Uh, someone said to us, I think it was Jeff yesterday, um, from the British Council, that everybody he meets who's been part of the Olympic Games still talks about it with enormous enthusiasm and warmth and commitment. Um, even though we were very tired at the end of it, it was an extraordinary opportunity. Artists made new partnerships. They found platforms for themselves which enabled them to play a much bigger role locally and nationally and internationally. For some of them, they have gone on to receive bigger commissions and new commissions from different parts of the world as well. And they've changed their practice. They've become more ambitious. Uh, they're working with different people in different ways. I think it's easy to look at the Olympic Games and think all sorts of cynical thoughts. But I hope that actually we've brought some optimism about the opportunities that you can find there. And you have the time now to engage in really good thinking. What did you call it, Ruth? Dreaming. And in dreaming, you can keep your artistic integrity right at the heart of that thinking. And if that's there at the beginning, it will come with you through to the end. Thank you very much. So about involving artists, um, Ruth, do you have anything to add? Um, I, that was very um, accurate and beautiful um, as ever. Um, I, I would say just that actually we were enormously impressed by the um, quality of thinking from the artists and cultural organizations that we have met. Uh, and when I think back to where I was just after the announcement of um, London winning the Olympic Games, I was exactly one of those negative people who could not see the opportunity. All I could see was the threat 
of money being taken away from the arts in order to build sports facilities for the Olympics. Um, and I was completely wrong to think that way, I now know. But I have not met anyone who uh, has said anything as stupid as I said when I, won the, when I saw London winning. I have seen people being thoughtful uh, and practical, um, thinking um, radical and interesting thoughts about what this says for Japan, for your relations with the world, for your relations with your neighbors in the Pacific Rim, um, what you can do in terms of exceptional art, uh, how you can enable young people, also old people, older communities. I have been so impressed by the range of thinking that you already have uh, that I feel enormously optimistic that you can create a brilliant cultural program. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. So involving artists and also having partnership with artists, having trust in artists in promoting the project was extremely important. So that was what we learned. And that was been mentioned a lot. And in that case, when I think uh, another important keyword would be partners. And in the presentation, the projects that were introduced to us, it wasn't just made by the artists and art-related people. Of course, there's sponsors involved, plus the local people involved. Various parties, other than artists, had to be involved and created partnerships. And that was how those wonderful art projects were enabled. And so I want to ask about the partners, especially for London 2012 Festival. This was been uh, held uh, throughout the country. I think this was a point that catches our interest. So when you carried the projects uh, all around the country, I believe it was uh, creative partners. Uh, there was a there were thir was uh, divided in 13 regions, the creative partners. I think that was what we learned from Moira. So how did you create and develop the partnership with the regions? Can we ask from Moira? Yeah, I think... Creative, pro creative programmer. Yeah. I think um, we tried different things, if we're to be frank about it, and some worked better than others, and it took quite a lot of time to really understand how to create the most effective partnerships. And certainly in the first few years, the enthusiasm for the games close to London was much better than the enthusiasm the further away you went. So in the northeast of the country, people were much less sure that they wanted to be partners and be engaged. There were a network of creative programmers who had been employed at a local level to start to create some enthusiasm um, with not very big budgets, uh, but the ability to connect people together, um, artists and communities. And their role changed over time. And by the end of the program, the four-year program, they were more effectively, I think, described as producers for Ruth in many cases and the program that she was establishing. It was important to have local government in those partnerships, so not to pretend that the local government in the region was um, not involved would, would have been a mistake, I think. It, there was a tension, I think, at the beginning with the idea that maybe national companies would come into local areas and regions and take over. And actually, over time, it became clear that you could establish really effective partnerships between bigger organizations and smaller organizations, and that there was a really interesting role for local organizations and small-scale arts organizations to be bar part of bigger projects. So not ignoring what's already there was also a really important lesson for us in developing a, a program. Thank you. 
And Ruth, I have a question to you, Ruth. So the you had a project that went around the country, and the projects were held throughout the country, and as part of the London 2012 festival. So, as an artistic director of the festival,、uh, you had to be the leader in consolidating this festival. So, I think you had a lot of difficulties in putting keep things together. So, can you share with us some of the difficulties you had? I hope you will not face some of these difficulties because some of them were very simply that I started in 2010, where of course I found that many many projects had already been planned. Uh, that is not a good position for an artistic director,、uh, because then you are in the position of saying no or yes. It's much easier if you are in、uh, appointed earlier, where you can develop the vision and the dreams, and then start projects together with your partners.、Uh, so I do not recommend that you appoint your cultural director late. I recommend you appoint them early. Um, but of course,、uh, the the job at whatever stage will always involve saying no to people because everyone offers you a brilliant idea,、uh, and as you all know, there is no festival director who can say yes to every idea、uh, because then it will not be shaped as a festival. It will,、uh, it will. There's no point in having a festival director actually if they say yes to every idea. So、um, it is never easy to say no,、um, and no one is ever happy to be told that they are not in a festival.、Um, but that the the choice the, the the choice of a curated and shaped program, as Justine said, is your only way to get a good program.、Um, that that has been proven in festivals all around the world. So、uh, I urge you to stick to. What what works, and have a festival director who has the power to create and select the program. Just just one more point.、Um, you, it would be good if people were flexible and open to possibility all the way through your thinking and through the design of your program. A really good example is the big dance. Which was a project that the mayor, mayor's team, and the arts council in London first came together, which was before the Olympics, and it was a, a project to get people in London dancing, and it started with some ambition, and then it grew through the cultural program,、um, and by the time we got to 2012, it was an enormous program, not only in London but across the country and actually internationally as well. I can't remember how many. I was going to say how many people took part in it. Five five million in twenty three countries. The, I, I mean, maybe I'll talk about the model of how that went national, which might be interesting.、Um, it, it was built on a hub structure, so、um, we identified in every region across the country a lead institution, and they became the kind of hub. Um, and so, and they could then span out and develop. Activity across their region, and so there were ten hubs across the UK that all fed into the one kind of central hub,、um, and that was a very powerful model because it meant that you could get a unified story, one big dance across the whole of the country, and also you got massive spread. You got lots of community level engagement,、um, and then internationally as well. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So to Justine, I have、uh, one more question about partners. So it was、uh, seen in the video, the Piccadilly Circus Circus. I think that was a wonderful、uh, project as well. And in order to do that, the Piccadilly Circus had to, since、uh, the 1945、uh, after World War II, you've closed the streets、uh, to have that circus. And around there, there are a lot of theaters surrounding there. So. I think it was、uh, really you had a lot of、uh, administrative work and clear a lot of、uh, regulations and rules in order to make that happen. 
And at that time, uh, you are you know, the head of culture in the mayor's office, and so you had to c- cooperate with the various partners, various parties. So can you uh, share with us the experience that you had in going through uh, making that happen? Yes. Um <laughs> <laughs> well, we came up with the idea, was the first step, um, and then of course we had to persuade many, many people to let us create this ridiculous, mad, crazy project. And I, I think the key to it was really, I mean the first meeting we had we, um, was with all the transport partners, the police, etc. And, uh, of course, from their perspective, they want to have traffic flowing as freely as possible. That's their number one objective during the Olympic Games, to have completely free-flowing traffic and people around the city and to have no congestion. And uh, we wanted to close London down (laughs) and do the opposite. (laughs) Uh, So we kind of got kicked out of the room. Uh, I think the key thing really was um, w- was the stage the stages we did it. So the first stage, we were never going to get agreement first off. So uh, we split it into two stages, and the first stage was a feasibility study, and that was very very important because everyone around the table, all of those partners, needed to have the confidence that nothing would go wrong, that it could be modelled. Um, and how would we clean it up afterwards? All of these things were really critical. And so we did a quite a detailed feasibility study and we modelled all the transport, the clean up, the police, the security issues. Um, and and that gave everyone confidence that was that we could do it. Um, and that was a, we wouldn't have done it without that first phase. We wouldn't have been able to make the leap into the green light at the end of it. Um, but I think the uh, it was very ambitious and it was, you know, as we said, it was once in a lifetime. We wanted to do this really fantastic surprise thing. And normally London gets closed down for more ceremonial events like the Queen's Jubilee. Um, and this was a moment where we closed it down for art. And that was quite symbolic and important. And, um, you know, people wrote about it and said Londoners had been given permission to play and to reclaim their streets. And after that, um, through the trauma of all those meetings, <laughs> um, Everyone who was involved in that from all the different agencies at the end of that show said, what are we going to do next? Um, Which I think was a fantastic legacy. And in fact, now all of the uh, businesses and the agencies are now looking at what they might do, how they might close it again, how they might do something else extraordinary in that space. It has changed the way they've seen the city and they can see the potential of culture in the centre of the city. And and I think, again, it's worth making the point... um, uh, that it took it took two years of meetings of feasibilities that everybody was involved in thinking through that those those feasibilities so all the people who were against the project worked on how to solve the problems through doing a feasibility study and that most brilliant of all um, some of the people who were most against the project ended up paying for the project so that when finally we got the green light, um, as we have said before, the, the contribution from the mayor's budget was not from the culture budget. It was from uh, the look and feel, from the, the, ver- the marketing budget to be spent putting flags on the streets. And what a brilliant way to market London, really. What an incredible piece of good value they got for uh, diverting their their own marketing budget into um, paying for incredible artists from around the world to do circus. Thank you very much. And actually, there are many, many other points that I would like to discuss, but um, the Secretariat has uh, been staring at me, telling me that I have to uh, keep time. So I would like to wrap up. Um, But... It seems uh, there may be a lot of things that we haven't been able to really uh, communicate. So I'd like to add just a few points here. Uh, This forum that we are having today, 
It talks about the Olympics being a very important event for culture, that it's a big opportunity for culture, and that's one thing, uh, one message that um, the British Council and the Arts Council is also trying to communicate. And why is it that art is um, important? We have heard a lot about that today. Uh, there are many people who think that Olympics is not their business, many people who haven't bought tickets. But because you have this cultural part, uh, it involves everybody into the Olympic Games, um, be it in London or um, in Tokyo. Uh, many people in other cities would start thinking that that's just being done in that city alone. It's not our town. But the cultural projects actually can involve the whole nation and that will also lead to tourism. Maybe people who came for the Olympic Games would uh, go travel to other regions of the country. So by bringing in the cultural perspective, this Olympic sports event becomes a much broader e event. I believe we can learn that from the London example. And the people in the audience today, looking at the name list, I believe there are people from all different um, walks of life, from the cultural agency as well as business people. Um, there are some artists also, and also people from the press. So Arts Council Tokyo and the British Council I would like to make this forum a starting point. Toward 2020, we have six and a half years. I believe we will have some ups and downs along the way. Yes, we were really enthusiastic when we knew uh, that we won the Olympics. And of course, uh, we have calmed down a little bit. Um, some people may start thinking uh, along the way, why are we spending so much money toward the Olymp for the Olympics? But in order to have a wonderful 2020 Olympics, um, British Council and Arts Council Tokyo would like to have similar form forums like this. And maybe invite the three speakers again and maybe other people who have been involved in the Olympic Games and the cultural events uh, toward 2012. So once again, um, I'd like to ask the audience to please inspire people toward 2012. Uh, and lastly, uh, I would like to ask each and every one of you for a very short message to all the audience here to close up, starting from Ruth, please. Well, um, I would say, as I said last night in the forum of the artists, that your first job is to dream uh, and really um, think of impossible ambitions. Uh, dream as, as ambitiously as you can, because you have the time to do that. Uh, and the better the dreams, the better the cultural plan will be. And then, after you have dreamt, it's time to make those dreams come true. Um, and I would say, after dreaming, um, <laughs> learn to love obstacles. Because there's going to be lots of them. There's always lots of obstacles. You just have to have the patience to keep hold of the dream and jump over the obstacles. And I would say, for those of you who aren't artists, um, Think about putting aside your egos as quickly as possible and coming together to work in partnership with one shared vision. You need each other if you're going to achieve everything that we think you can. Hi. Thank you very much. I believe we have heard very encouraging messages at the end. And. I would like to once again thank the three speakers of, who have traveled all the way from London. Um, a big round of applause, please. Thank you very much uh, to all the three speakers and the facilitator. Um, Lastly, from um, the British Council, we have uh, Mr. Jeff Streeter to say a few words. Mm 
皆様こんにちは。Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen.、Um, first of all, thank you all of you for coming this afternoon on, on a snowy day in Tokyo to listen to、uh, scintillating talks that we've heard.、Um, I think we're all profoundly moved by the effort made by you all to be here today. Secondly, I'd like to thank our partners in the Tokyo Arts Council、uh, for putting on this event. We're extremely grateful for everything that you've done. And of course,、uh, we're extremely grateful、uh, for Mitch for his wonderful、uh, dealing with the panel, and of course, our three great speakers, Ruth, Justine, and Moira, who've come all the way from the UK to share their experience and their knowledge. And I think it's already become apparent to all of you. That、uh, there is nothing between the three of them that they, that they don't know about how to put on a cultural Olympiad.、Um, this is all of the expertise you will ever need on how to put together a cultural Olympiad in one room together, a unique opportunity. I was asked yesterday publicly why does the UK care about Tokyo 20? Why are you doing this? Why would the British Council be involved in that? And it's a very clear message. We We see this dialogue around the Olympics and Olympic、uh, cultural p r o g r a m as a key part of our cultural relationship, indeed, as part of the relationship between our two countries. A relationship that began 400 years ago and was beautifully summed up by eloquent words from Tokugawa Iyasu, who talked about in a letter to King James the, the, the great distance that、uh, separated us, but the friendship that Existed and could exist between our two island nations. And that spirit has continued over 400 years. And 150 years ago, about the time that the London Metro was being、uh, dug under London, initially to great opposition, then of course everybody loved it later, 150 years ago, the Choshu Five left Japan when it was still illegal to do so, went to study, in fact, in London and then later Glasgow, and brought back. Insights into industrialization that helped to forge the modern uh, Meiji uh, uh, era in Japan. And we like to think of the current era, particularly around the Olympics, as also a special time for the relationship between our two countries. So 2012 to 2020 for us is a very special time in the cultural and, and broader relationship between Japan and the UK. And it's our passion for learning, for sharing, for overcoming obstacles. And also for being open. The friendship between our two countries permits us to be open about the problems that we've had, and we pass on that to you as a gift, we hope, for, for your learning,、uh, because our ambition, of course, is that you will surpass our cultural p r o g r a m in London and, and do an even better one in 2020.、Um, I hope. That、uh, the, the visit from our experts from the UK has been an opportunity to pick up、uh, some key messages. Daring to dream, I think, is one of the most important.、Um, and we, we、uh, are here committed to continue this dialogue. And we hope that in certain particular areas we can continue to work on ideas, particularly unlimited, as you saw earlier, a key part. Of、uh, 2012. It will be in 2016, and we hope we'll continue into 2020, and we would love to be part of that, of course. Tokyo, as we all know, is one of the world's great cities, admired throughout the world. Japanese art and culture, we know, are admired throughout the world. There's a huge interest. In Japanese culture and art in the UK, and of course everywhere else around the world. And these are reasons for believing that 2020 and the cultural p r o g r a m will be very, very special indeed. I'm sure that the vision that you come up with will be truly unlimited. It will be、um, one bound on,、uh, based on ambition. Will become a huge inspiration and will become, like so many things that you create in Japan, a thing of beauty. And above all, I hope, like、uh, the p r o g r a m in London and the UK, it will be one that is open to all. It will take huge courage and determination and a great deal of effort to get there, but、uh, we in the UK、um, are here to help you, and we have absolutely no doubt that you will achieve something that will be wonderful for Tokyo, for Japan, and for the whole world. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would like to end the forum today for the Olympics, Paralympics, and cultural program. Thank you very much for your participation.